It's time to spring into something delicious with HelloFresh. Every week you get fresh pre-portioned ingredients with recipes delivered to your door. Get 16 free meals plus three free gifts with code MLM16 at hellofresh.com slash MLM16. The Wolf of Wall Street. Chances are you've heard this title before. Whether it's because you're obsessed with financial schemes, you've seen the movie featuring Leonardo DiCaprio, or it's just come up in casual conversation, the term the Wolf of Wall Street conjures up images of a glamorous, glitzy life and money to burn. Many know that this wolf himself, Jordan Belfort, has also been charged with serious white collar crimes too. However, what you probably don't know about are the manipulative, disgusting tendencies he adopted, his so-called vulgar memoir, the concerning way he treated his female employees and his questionable TikTok, because of course that's a thing now. So who is Jordan Belfort and what is he up to now? Let's get into it. Hello everyone, and welcome to Multi-Level Mondays. I'm the Illuminati, and as I mentioned in the intro, we're gonna be discussing the Wolf of Wall Street, Jordan Belfort. If you look him up today, you might see his Twitter, which is a sort of mishmash of tweets that either promote his podcast, tell yo mama jokes, or show photos of him and his partner. Nothing too outrageous, really. But if you happen to find his TikTok, that's a slightly different story. At first, you might see his motivational type videos. These days, Jordan is a motivational speaker, so it makes sense for him to promote this type of content. He tells people that money doesn't buy happiness, but a lack of money is a passport to misery and explains why money is so important, which feels a bit obvious, but moving on. He's also made videos claiming that he'll never apologize for his success. And if you think he's superficial or materialistic, you should go get a job at fucking McDonald's because that's where you fucking belong. That's a quote. The comments in the video are a bit mixed to say the least. While there are some comments calling him the goat, there are others that say he's lucky to not be in prison, he still owes $100 million to the government and he scammed people out of stocks. Others state that success isn't theft or that even if their job isn't the best, at least they aren't $100 million in debt. I've heard it said that a lot of people who live this kind of large lifestyle posture and show off their wealth do tend to have a bit of debt behind the scenes. Now, the only difference between Jordan and them is I suppose the fact that everyone knows that he owes about nine figures to the government. It's not really behind the scenes at all. Aside from the motivational videos and content that just shows off his supposed wealth, Jordan also has another genre of videos entirely. One's talking about, well, um, male genitals. And I'm not even joking. He has a strangely large amount of videos just talking about this. In one, he duets another TikToker who jokes that men should give up pleasuring themselves, saying that he's done so for all of seven or eight minutes and feels so much better. In another TikTok, he tells his partner what the average wood size is, duetting another TikToker that made a video about a study measuring male genitals. In another, he's analyzing a TikTok where two young women are glancing down at each other's crotches with the words, what's something you could eat every day being asked on screen, pretty clearly implying some oral sex. He duets it and asks, are they talking about pussy or cock? Which I don't know, it kind of comes across weird given the vast age difference between him and the women, but that's my personal opinion. Maybe, you know, that's just me. So how did Jordan go from being the Wolf of Wall Street, a notorious scam artist to telling people to get a job at McDonald's on TikTok? And if he's so rich, why the hell isn't he paying back the government and the people he's hurt? So let's start at the beginning and see what we can find out. Jordan Belfort was born in 1962 and grew up in Queens, New York. According to Investopedia, he showed an understanding of the business world from an early age. He's also stated in interviews that growing up, money itself was what he wanted most of all. When he was only eight years old, he was delivering papers. When he was 12 years old, he was shoveling driveways after snowstorms. In Jordan's memoir, The Wolf of Wall Street, he talks about how he sold Italian water ices on the beach near his childhood home when he was 16 and managed to make $20,000 with his friend during the summers. And it is worth noting that this is according to his book and there's really no other confirmation or denial on this information. Apparently, Jordan intended on enrolling in dental school and he even studied biology at American University. But when the Dean of the University of Maryland School of Dentistry told students that they wouldn't make a lot of money as a dentist, he dropped out. According to Jordan, the moment he heard this, he stood up and walked out of the seminar where the Dean was speaking, leaving on his very first day. Instead, he answered a blind ad to get involved with the meat business, going door to door and selling lobster tails and other meat products. The first day I broke the company record and I realized I had a gift for selling, Jordan states. 
After about three, four weeks, I was like, why should I work for these people when I can go these people by myself? I bought one truck, started training people, bought a second truck. The gift I had wasn't even for sales per se. It was the ability to train and motivate other people. Before I knew it, I had 26 trucks, 26 salesmen, and I thought I was making a fortune. Jordan wasn't actually making a fortune, as he himself explains. He was overexpanding and undercapitalized. He was making mistakes that perhaps any new business owner would make. As a result, Jordan had to file for bankruptcy at age 25 and his business ultimately failed. It wasn't long until Jordan decided to get involved with stock brokering. And for six months, he says he had a job as a connector, just passing the phone to more qualified people. The people around Jordan were making half a million to a million dollars a year and Jordan, still being broke, was seemingly envious of their success. He wanted to know how he could finally make it rich. How could he do what they were doing? Though Jordan was, as he puts it, full of piss and vinegar, his very first day truly working on Wall Street was October 19th, 1987, the day of the great crash, also known as Black Monday, when the stock market plummeted. Just like that, the game was over. I never got to play, he said. The firm he was working with shut down and once more he was out of a job and absolutely desperate. Jordan answered a help wanted ad to got a job as a stockbroker and claimed that yet again on the first day he shattered the company record. Within the first six months, Jordan said he was making a million dollars a year as a stockbroker just by selling penny stocks. But more importantly, he remembered the other skill he had, training others. Just like with the meat selling business, Jordan seemed to have the idea wheedle its way back into his mind again. Why wouldn't he go into business for himself? Now, before I get into Jordan's own business, let me explain what penny stocks are for those of you who have may never heard the term before. And as an aside, the term is kind of interchangeable with micro cap. So if you hear either of those terms, it's really the same thing. Basically, penny stocks are stocks that can literally be worth pennies, which large companies like Google, Apple, Microsoft, Tesla, they're relatively stable and worth a fair bit. Penny stocks, however, are far more unpredictable and worth far less, as the stocks are typically from companies worth less than six figures. Some investors will purchase penny stocks in the hopes that the company might strike it big and become a Fortune 500 company, giving them astronomical amounts of profit and riches beyond their wildest dreams. As you can imagine, this is very rarely the reality and a pretty good way to lose the shirt off your back. Investopedia writes, according to the Securities and Exchange Commission, a stock that is not listed on a national stock exchange and that trades under $5 is a penny stock. Penny stocks can technically be worth a few dollars, but the point is they're much cheaper, riskier, and it's difficult to determine their future. And penny stock scams are not uncommon. When Jordan decided he wanted his own company, these kinds of stocks are where he saw potential. After all, he is a great salesman. He could sell his clients anything, including penny stocks. Jordan Belfort created Stratton Oakmont, an over-the-counter brokerage house in the late 80s. He had a couple partners like Kenneth Green and Daniel Perouche at his side. Green was an investor center graduate who had driven one of the meat trucks. A 1991 Forbes article claims that the pair of them had actually started off by opening up a franchise and minor broke dealer, Stratton Securities, before they were able to buy out the entire Stratton operation five months later. Green owned a 20% stake in Stratton Oakmont when it opened. As for Daniel Perouche, who was called Donnie Azoff in the film, just FYI, they apparently met through one of their wives knowing each other. Some say Perusha's first wife knew Belfort. They didn't meet at dinner as the movie, The Wolf on Wall Street portrays. And as a brief aside, Jordan Scam was also inspired the movie Boiler Room, but The Wolf of Wall Street is based off of Belfort's own memoirs. So that's why I'm referencing the movie as well. With a few good friends at his side, Belfort was in business. Stratton Oakmont would sell penny stocks, building up a reputation by saying these penny stocks were fantastic, hyping them up and making misleading positive statements. Of course, Belford had actually purchased the stock for cheap, but he was able to sell it at a higher price to these investors. Once investors were on board, Belford and his brokers dumped their shares, making the stock price drop. The Crime Museum says that the word of this easy making money scheme spread, which is why so many young wannabe stockbrokers started applying at Stratton Oakmont in the first place. Their article also writes that at the time, the firm's motto was don't hang up until the client buys or dies. As far as I can tell, Stratton Oakmont was like this from the start. It doesn't seem like an honest, legitimate business that went astray, but a classic pump and dump scheme that was just a part of who they were. In fact, as early as 1991, just about two years after they were founded, Rula Khalif, a journalist at Forbes, had quite a few negative things to say about their company. She wrote that the company specializes in pushing dicey stocks on gullible investors, and that though the company was on track to make $30 million that year, Stratton and Oakmont's customers were already making complaints. Hell, the SEC was already investigating them at this point and Belford had confirmed the investigation. She said that a former Stratton broker told her about another motto floating around the firm, whip their necks off, don't let them off the phone. 
Stratton Oakmont was really just a boiler room, a call center where young workers rang everyone and anyone, pushing them to buy shares in these companies. The firm's mindset was plain and simple, to sell at any cost. One of the companies they pushed was Ventura Entertainment Group. Ventura had recently lost half a million dollars off revenues of $3 million, but Stratton Oakmont sold 400,000 Ventura units for $12 each, bumping the share to $15. At that point, Belfort quickly told brokers to buy back the warrants for $1 each from pleased investors while continuing to push the stock. Then within months, he unloaded them for $10, making a $9 profit on each one. Now, there's nothing wrong with buying penny stocks as a whole, but to sell them to clients without disclosing that he was the one purchasing all the shares, leaving them with a risky stock not nearly worth what they thought, that's where the crime comes in. Of course, Jordan Belfort didn't exactly seem concerned because he was living large. He earned a fortune of hundreds of millions of dollars. He had a partying, globe-trotting lifestyle. He was on multiple different kinds of drugs like cocaine and quaaludes. He married a model and literally sunk his yacht in the Mediterranean and crashed a helicopter. And for those of you that might not know, quaaludes were an extremely popular kind of drug in the 60s and 70s that are similar to barbiturates. They can give a high or euphoric feeling and they can be quite addictive. In the movie, Wolf of Wall Street, they depict all of this, really focusing on the extravagance and craziness of the Stratton office. In one scene, they even have a little person shot out of a cannon and an oversized target in the office. The movie depicts Stratton as, in essence, a frat house. Jordan himself confirmed this and said he even put up signs having to declare the office a fuck-free zone, though he claims no one followed the rule. The money was rolling in and Jordan was seemingly living that glamorous, wealthy wildlife he always wanted. But the cracks were beginning to show and people were starting to ask questions. In 1994, Stratton Oakmont had to pay $2.5 million for a civil securities fraud case by the SEC. His drug use worsened and police were called to his home for domestic violence incidents during each one he had reportedly kicked his wife down the stairs and then drove a car through the garage with his children inside the vehicle. He was arrested, spent some time in rehab and then returned home. It was a short while later that Stratton Oakmont found itself in litigation once again, though this time they were suing the company Prodigy. As I understand it, people on Prodigy's message board had called out Stratton Oakmont making defamatory statements. And Stratton argued that since Prodigy published these statements, they were liable for them. The party settled in October, 1995, but needless to say, word was spreading about Stratton Oakmont. The Wall Street Journal published an article in 1996 stating that Stratton Oakmont was being charged with fraud. The NASD or National Association of Securities Dealers alleged that Perush, the president, as well as the trader, broker, and vice president director all improperly traded initial public stock offerings. Perush's lawyer tried to brush this all off as ancient history, but the allegations were severe. Even Steve Madden was involved as a few years prior, Stratton had invested half a million dollars in him. They took his company public and valued his $3 million shares at $15 million total, which while that might be valuable now, was way overinflated at the time. According to the SEC, Madden had acted as a flipper by purchasing IPO stock, then quickly selling it back to Stratton, hiding the fact that they retained control over almost all of the outstanding shares for each issue they brought public. And this happened for at least 22 IPOs in total. So to put it bluntly, he was manipulating the market. However, investigations against Stratton were far from over. FBI Special Agent Greg Coleman began looking into Belfort in 1992. He told The Independent that Belfort was especially awful as there were so many victims who could ill afford to lose money that he took from them. Now, Belfort was difficult to catch as he used other people's names and other employees to do their business. However, once Belfort started smuggling money out of the country, that's when Coleman, as well as former assistant US attorney, Joel Cohen, got their first breakthrough. The funds in these Swiss bank accounts were laundered, and in other words, they were large amounts of dirty illegal money. Since Belfort wasn't exactly paying taxes on it, tax evasion was, quote, the crowbar we used to open them up. It took time, but Belfort's Swiss banker cooperated with them and gave investigators concrete evidence to go after Belfort. With that in hand, they were finally able to arrest him and Perouche in September, 1998. In 1999, both men pled guilty and the firm was labeled the most infamous boiler room brokerage firm in recent memory, according to one of the prosecutors. They were made to forfeit money worth around $16 million and cooperated with investigators, with Perouche also pleading guilty to conspiracy to engage in insider trading. Finally, in 2004, Belfort was convicted and ultimately ordered to pay back $110.4 million into a compensation agreement. He served just 22 months of a four-year sentence. While in prison, his cellmate encouraged him to write about his story. And so once he was released, Belfort did exactly that. He was given a $1 million advance for his book, The Wolf of Wall Street. And hey, that's great because now he can use those $1 million to pay back all the people he's hurt, right? Plus the book sure seems successful after all. And there's a movie based on his experiences and that earned him almost a million dollars as well. So that's $2 million, a dent at bare minimum anyway. 
After all, these people were swindled out of money they genuinely needed. Ken Miner, a real estate appraiser in California, had drawn on a home equity line of credit to buy stocks with Stratton. As of 2013, he still has not been able to repay it. I'm not a rich guy and I've been paying for it ever since, he said. When asked if he would see the Wolf of Wall Street movie, Miner said, if I see it, it will be for free. Another investor, architect Peter Springsteel, said that he was cold called by Stratton in the early 90s. He'd just been starting his own business, but lost about half his life savings after that. A veterinarian in Colorado, Dr. DeQueen, says his father lost a quarter of a million dollars and suffered a stroke under the stress of his losses. He had been persuaded to take his money out of the brokerage firm where he'd had a very long-term relationship and put it with Stratton Oakmont. I remember thinking, oh gosh, he's finally getting old enough where people are taking advantage of him. And take advantage of him, they did. Stratton Oakmont's boiler room employees had that motto after all, the idea that you don't stop selling until the client buys or dies. And with some clients, AKA the victims, they sell them blue chip companies, more reputable ones with a longstanding history in order to gain their trust before pressuring them to buy penny stocks. Others, such as Dr. DeQuine's father, were simply defrauded. It hardly sounds like a well thought out scheme at points, but downright just taking advantage of elderly people. So back to my point, it's great that Belford is earning money again. Now he can use the sales of his book and the royalties from the movie to pay these people back if nothing else. At least that's what I would say if that were the case. Unfortunately, he's been living large, exaggerating as much as ever, not paying back a penny and selling people on expensive motivational conferences. All of which leads us into potentially our most infuriating chapter of this story. What is he up to now? And before we get into the modern day Wolf of Wall Street and his activities, let's take a quick moment to thank today's sponsors. We're all looking for ways to reduce our environmental footprints. So it's extra disturbing to find out that we throw away about 5 billion plastic cleaning bottles every single year. But we can stop throwing out so much plastic with Blue Land's revolutionary refilling cleaning system. Because Blue Land has a simple premise. You buy one bottle and refill it forever, so there's nothing to discard. You fill their gorgeous bottles with warm water and a Blue Land soap or spray cleaning tablet, and in just a couple minutes, you've got powerful cleaning products. And they smell amazing too. And they've got everything to clean your entire house from hand soaps, toilet tablet cleaners, laundry detergents, which I've mentioned, I love it that theirs is unscented and it doesn't irritate my skin, very important. So make sure you try Blue Land because the planet will thank you. And right now you can get 20% off your first order when you go to blueland.com slash MLM. That's 20% off your very first order of any Blue Land products at blueland.com slash MLM, blueland.com slash MLM. This episode is also sponsored by DoorDash because life is chaotic and then you sometimes have to feed yourself on top of it and you just don't have the time. But it's cool because DoorDash can tame some of that chaos for you. DoorDash can get you what you want to eat right now and right to your door. They've got restaurants you love and they'll even grab groceries and other essentials for you in well under an hour. So it doesn't matter if you want some late night ice cream or maybe you forgot a key ingredient for dinner, they'll grab it. Are you stocking up groceries for the week? DoorDash can do that too. And I was actually very recently doing some meal prepping for Casper to make sure that he's got all of his fresh food for the upcoming week. And I like to put them in little baggies and I ran out of little baggies. So I quickly used DoorDash and got new ones. And for a limited time, our listeners can get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter code MLM. That's up to 25% off a $10 value and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter code MLM. Don't forget that's code MLM for 25% off your first order with DoorDash. Subject to change and terms apply. Jordan likes to exaggerate clearly. He's certainly had a way with words when it comes to defrauding his clients and being such a great salesman that he broke company records left and right. However, after the movie about Belfort was released, former employees were quick to call Jordan out and say that the movie and the memoir for which it was named were nothing more than Belfort selling himself to the public. One of the first to speak up was Josh Shapiro, who told the New York Post in early December, 2013, about a week before the movie's release, what working for him was really like. According to Shapiro, the boiler room was genuinely intense with 300 young brokers screaming into phones, standing up all while Perouche had a lavish office in the corner. It was almost cultish and you were hooked in from day one, he claimed. There were cold callers in the back, brokers in the front. Brokers wore designer brands like Armani and the motivational meetings were incredible. Apparently Perouche would rip up hundred dollar bills, throw them on the floor and ask people if they wanted to be a loser or make it big. If someone didn't do well, he'd say something like, you sold 1000 shares of stock in the last three weeks. You know, you should have slit your throat when you were shaving this morning. At other times, Perouche was on quaaludes and fell off desks or smashed computer monitors. Shapiro claims they motivated sellers with massive rewards. 
Perush offered to lease him a sports car when he managed to open 28 accounts in one month. Bosses wouldn't just offer cars, but women too. Gina girls, as the office called them, were $500 an hour sex workers that bosses would pay for their employees. In addition, Shapiro argues that many people were called qualified investors with gambling habits. Bait and switches, expensive incentives, rampant drug use, it sure does sound like the Wolf of Wall Street movie. And as true as that might be, Perush himself has actually spoken out about Belfort, his memoir, and the movie. According to him, the book is a distant relative of the truth, and the film is a distant relative of the book. In other words, there may be nuggets of truth in there, but some things simply did not happen the way Belfort describes. The biggest and perhaps most surprising point of contention is the fact that Perush argues no one even referred to Belfort as the wolf. While sex was definitely integrated into office life, declaring the office a fuck-free zone apparently never happened, nor did dwarf tossing, as Belfort's book calls it, or chimpanzees in the office. Perush insists that he would never abuse little people or animals. Stratton was a fraternity with goofing around and hazing, but Perush didn't support the idea of glorifying crime. That said, he doesn't resent Belfort either. He told Belfort to start a new legitimate business instead of living in the past as Belfort seems to be doing, but he also seems to buy the image of Belfort as a changed man. They're not on unfriendly terms anyway. However, though former Stratton employees may claim that the movie is a bit exaggerated or a play off of reality, others call the source material, Jordan's book, downright vile. In the prologue, Jordan apologizes for what he's done, giving off this changed man vibe, yet sources argue that he has a self-serving despicable voice throughout the entire memoir. Daily Beast goes so far to state he's belligerent, obnoxious, and delights in making fun of Japanese accents and graphically describing all sorts of sexual depravity with prostitutes and even a 17-year-old sales assistant. Apparently, Belfort claimed that he and Perush had a three-way with a teenage assistant, though Perush has vehemently denied this ever taking place. I actually found the book online and found the exact passage in which he describes this to his sales assistant. And I wanna warn you now that this is extremely gross and a bit graphic, so yeah, here you go. The process had officially gotten underway in October, 1989, when 21-year-old Peter Galetta, one of the initial eight Strattonites, christened the building's glass elevator with a quick blowjob and an even quicker rear entry into the luscious loins of a 17-year-old sales assistant. She was Stratton's first sales assistant, and for better or worse, she was blonde, beautiful, and wildly promiscuous. At first, I was shocked I had even considered firing Peter for dipping his pen into the company Inkwell. But within a week, the young girl had proven to be a real team player, blowing all eight Strattonites, most of them in the glass elevator, and me under my desk. Anyway, about a month later, after a tiny bit of urging, Danny convinced me that it would be good if we both did her at the same time, which we did on a Saturday afternoon while our wives were out shopping for Christmas dresses. And the way he describes women in the book is just kind of gross, to put it plainly. If he were actually remorseful for his actions, he doesn't really come across that way, to put it mildly. He comes off as if he's bragging. Even the investigators that worked on the case, Coleman and Cohen, have mixed feelings about Jordan's legacy. Cohen says he worries the movie is just about his rise and quote, dwarfs being thrown out of cannons. I fear it is being marketed as a general comment of all that ails society, when in fact, it is a sordid story about bad people who do not represent society at all. Cohen insists that though Belfort says 95% of what he did is legit and he's not a complete crook, like for example, Bernie Madoff, this simply is not the case. Belfort didn't just step over the line a little bit, but he was constantly looking to rip people off every single day. But what about Belfort? It's been well over a decade and a half since he was released and has he started cleaning up his act at all? Is he paying people back and turning over a new leaf? Well, you can probably guess the answer because of course not. Belfort was ordered to pay $110 million in restitution in 2013 to his victims. After assets were seized and initial payments made, he owed about 97. As the movie came out, it kickstarted his career as a motivational speaker, and he isn't a cheap speaker either. Independent says that he charges $5,000 entrance fee and $30,000 hourly. A court requires him to pay 50% of his earnings into a compensation fund, but as far as I can tell, either no one wants him as a speaker or he's ignoring that. Bloomberg reported that between 2007 and 2009, he paid about $700,000, likely from the movie and book deal. Then in 2010, he stopped paying. Prosecutors claim that he earned $9 million in speaking engagements between 2003 and 2015, but pocketed all of it. Plus he has other income from a building design business that he isn't paying either. Those that have actually been to his seminars don't have great things to say about it in the first place. Su Yoon wrote in 2014 that Belfort was anything but humble as he boasted about sinking a yacht and cheating on his wife during his peak, if you can call that a peak. Then his friend pitches a real estate deal during the seminar, calling it a guaranteed method to make money. Sue writes, 
Curiously, he detailed the subprime mortgage meltdown and the financial crisis while using the same pitch the banks used for Liar's Loans in a 40 minute live infomercial. It seems outrageous to me, but people around me are buying into it. Apparently, people tried to get refunds insulted by his pitch and some even walked out. At the very end, he made another pitch, a three-day seminar for just under $2,000. It's a steal, according to Belfort, who values the seminar at $10,000. Sue also claims that his speaking fees can even cost $100,000 for a day's worth of work and that Belfort told her he wants to pay back restitution, he just can't because lawyers want to take their share in fees. As Sue points out, US government attorneys are salaried, they don't bill by the hour. So I highly doubt he pays more than is required, like he says, or else he wouldn't have stopped paying in 2010. Still, at these speaking engagements, he insists that he'll feel a lot better when everyone is paid back. Sure, he says he wants to pay people back, but he's not giving up any of the $9 million he's made, which is, you know, much, much more than someone needs to live off of. In his TikToks, he is constantly living it up on boats, around luxurious cars and nice looking homes. He's not living below his means so he can afford to pay back the people he's hurt, but you know, lifestyle. Plus, the way he seems to justify buying these expensive items is honestly a bit laughable. In an interview on The Room Live, his interviewer, Grant Lewers, states how by buying a Ferrari and a more expensive car, he's helping the economy. He's giving the salesman and the people that manufacture the car a job after all. Jordan seems to agree with this, though he says a Ferrari isn't a great example, going on to add that, I'll show you how to get a Ferrari. Get making money is easy. It's really, really easy. To make matters worse, what is quite possibly the most hypocritical lawsuit I've ever seen, Jordan Belfort filed a lawsuit against the Wolf of Wall Street movie production company for fraud. According to the Los Angeles Times, Red Granite Pictures was engulfed in the Malaysian financial scandal in 2017. In the scandal, it was uncovered that the movie's producer, Riza Aziz, had laundered $248 million from a state investment fund, along with other members of his family. He has complained that he's been damaged by that, and if he were untied from this deal with Red Granite, he could make a sequel with his second book. He's seeking $300 million in damages. The most current litigation update I've seen so far is that Belford and Granite are going to resolve this in arbitration, though no word has been released about that. Now, a part of me wonders if Jordan is just doing this to avoid paying back his victims, considering that the government has ordered him to pay back more money in 2018. Now, whatever he earns from his business, Delos Living, has to be given into that restitution fund, which frankly, I think could have been ordered a long time ago, but Delos Living isn't his only job. Recently, on March 4th, 2022, Jordan announced that he was going to host his first ever crypto slash NFT mastermind at his real estate this coming April. You have to apply to be considered for a spot. And this comes after just one week of Crypto World Con in Miami, where Jordan is a key speaker. Considering how penny stocks are volatile, it sort of does make sense that Jordan would decide to enter another volatile fluctuating market. The market that, by the way, he claims to understand almost flawlessly, even when he's previously said he's actually hated it. Jordan told Coindesk last year that he predicted the value in crypto coin dropping in 2017. Pretty much to the day. So when I said that I thought Bitcoin was ridiculously old valued and based on nothing, I believe at the time I was right, 100%. That year, Jordan told CNN that the underlying asset of Bitcoin was unregulated and that too many people could use it for massive pump and dump schemes. I think it's a huge danger right now that people are looking at this as like the next great thing. It's a bubble for sure. So why get involved now? Well, he admits that back then he was very anti-crypto coin and he assumed the government was going to shut it down during the early crypto years. Now that there are bigger players involved, he believes it would be harder to shut down and he's calling himself a big fan of blockchain technology. And my opinion here, but you know, call me cynical. But when I hear this, I hear, I thought crypto was stupid at first, but when I saw such a massive demand for it and the way to use it to scam people, I want it in. I recognize that by this point, I'm definitely disgusted by and biased against Jordan, but love to hear your thoughts on it. I obviously have my own thoughts and I just go, huh, so you thought it was a little too risky. And then you see all these pump and dumps going on everywhere. And I'm like, what does it remind you of the olden days or something? You're trying to get back into it. Gonna make some quick money this way by hurting more people. I don't know, my opinion though. Of course, he still warns against meme stocks like Dogecoin and Shiba Inu cryptocurrencies, even going so far as to say that the creators of these quote shit coins should be jailed but he's entering the internet currency world more and more. A few months ago, he purchased an NFT, CryptoPunk6033, which as of writing this remains his Twitter profile picture. Jordan even stated that he wants to start his own NFT project, a collection of artwork that is inspired by the Wolf of Wall Street movie and my life. Although the first one was set to drop January 25th, 2022, the day before, he announced he was delaying the drop so the market would stabilize. Though he publicly endorsed Squirrel Wallet's NFTs a short while later, I haven't found any sources as of writing this in early March that Jordan has ever dropped his own NFT artwork for sure. 
It does seem a bit odd to me that Jordan went from hating Bitcoin and giving advice to the public to get out of it as if he's some financial expert only to begin endorsing Bitcoin just a couple short years later. People can change their minds, absolutely, but given his particular past and the fact that he's now presenting as an expert on Bitcoin, I'm just a bit suspicious. That's, that's it, I'm just really suspicious about it all. All in all, I have to agree with many of the criticisms in Belfort's comments. I'm not taking financial advice from someone who owes the government about $100 million. But of course, all of this is just my opinion, thoughts, and just little pieces of information, news articles, facts, things that I've gathered together to compile today's episode. Feel free to make what you want of it. I took, you know, my thoughts away on it. You can have yours. But with all of that being said, that is where we are going to end today's episode. And if you did enjoy today's episode, make sure you're liking, following, and subscribing so you can keep up to date on more episodes just like this. And if you wanna check out an episode very similar to this, maybe you should check out the Bernie Madoff episode. And unlike what Belfort would want you to believe, they are not all that different. But again, with that being said, that is the end of today's episode. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye. 